Bismillah, elhamdülillah, ve salatu ve selamu ala Rasulillah ve alihi ve sahbihi ve men vela. Entering the space of the fasting month puts us into a very different uh, cognitive frame. Uh, we need change just as we need continuity. If life was nothing but stasis and routine, we'd hardly be human. It's those disruptions that bring us to life. But similarly, if life was nothing but uh, disruption, and no stillness and no continuity, the anxiety and the agitation would overwhelm us. So our lives are in a sense lived in a balance between the new and the familiar. The Islamic pattern of worship by which heaven seeks to reconnect us to our created biological cosmic selves is a return from linear time to cyclical time. Ancient humanity experienced not the ticking of a clock, but rather the rising, the setting of the sun, the phases of the moon, the human biorhythms, male as well as female, are linked very closely to these diurnal, circadian and monthly rhythms. We are engaged with the created world. Modernity takes us away from that, snatches us, as it were, from the womb, which is our real identity, and plunges us into an unfamiliar, dry, uh, in many ways, threatening space. Religion, however, is about reconnecting mind, body and spirit and producing a holistic, balanced human being. This is the mizan, which is to be there in the horizon of the soul as well as in the horizon of the outside world. So human beings are a kind of microcosm of the larger created existence. The larger created existence is in a sense a sign of what we are. The one is the matrix of the other and its purpose. So when we enter a sacred space, we move away from linear time, the ultimately artificial human inspired ticking of the clock, and move into cyclical time, sacred time. That is in a sense, a measure of uh, a sacred space to the extent that it reminds us of what time really is, subjective but divine and linked to the reality of the movement of the sun and the moon, it is a sacred space. So in a traditional mosque, one, as it were, sits down, and whether or not there is a clock present, one notices the movement of the sun through the windows. One notices that the prayer times are determined by the rolling of the planet beneath our feet. One notices that the months are determined not by the random conventions of the Emperor Julius Caesar, but rather by something that is intrinsic in the creation itself. Husban, where Shamsu, where Qamaru, be Husban. The sun and the moon are there for reckoning. And also, the solar and the moon are there, Lita'lamu Adad as Sinin, well Hisab, so that you might know the number of the years and calculation. So when we enter one of these lunar months, and we do so most emphatically when the Hilal is sighted and Ramadan comes upon us, we are much more acutely aware of this aspect of our dependence upon the cosmic matrix of our, uh, of our naturalness. We're taken away from the artificial uh, haste of modernity and pitched into a space where uh, the sun and the moon still determine our metabolism and our activities and the form of our life in the way that they did for primordial man. 99% of the history of our species we have lived as part of nature. Modernity has taken us out of that with various psychic and environmental uh, consequences. Religion is there to put us back into it without making us complete outsiders. So Ramadan is a reminder of that gift. Ramadan is when we notice the phases of the moon. Ramadan is when we notice the rising and the setting of the sun as prehistoric man did and hence there is a certain healing because we are reconnected to that form of life which is a biological form which is our true nature. So fasting is a spiritual healing as well as the physical healing, the shifa. Sumo tasihu, fast be healthy is the commandment 
that is not just about you know, the intermittent fasting that uh, medical science now agrees is part of what we are uh, and part of what is good for us. Prehistoric man didn't snack all day but had occasional large meals and then went hungry and thirsty for an extended period while he was looking for the next water hole. Our metabolism is not adjusted for modern life where there is always a coffee machine at hand and another snack bar. Uh, no, we're designed to be cyclically hungry and sated and Ramadan connects us to that through intermittent fasting and reawakens something that is natural in our metabolism. So physically healthy for sure but also spiritually healthy in this deeper sense of reconnecting us to the fitra. But there is another dimension to this, which is that when we are connected to fitra, our awareness of the world becomes sharper. We notice things better. Why? Because we're not distracted by thoughts of the next snack. Uh, and we notice the world and we are distant from it in a sense that improves our capacity to observe. And the natural world is itself a form of nourishment. A sign of the real believer is that he genuinely lives according to the Quranic instruction. That's the mark of the believer, thinks about the way heaven and earth are created, not in some kind of naturalistic theology, logic chopping way, but more elemental. These are the ulul albab, the people of inner sight of core, the seed, that most organic natural thing that is within us, that is the receptacle of the mystery of the spirit, uh, is focused and made more luminous during the month of Ramadan. إِذَا دَخَلَ شَهْرُ رَمَضَانِ فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ وَصُفِّدَتِ الشَّيَاطِينِ وَنَادَ مُنَادٍ يَا بَاغِي الْخَيْرُ هَلُمْ it's a well-known hadith in Tirmidhi. When the month of Ramadan comes in, the gates of heaven are opened and the gates of hell are locked. And a herald angel calls out, O you who seek for good, rise up. O you who seek for evil, restrain yourselves. And this is our experience in Ramadan, that the vices come less easily. Hmm? Gluttony and lust are the most obviously uh, sedated and abolished, uh, which enables the spiritual sight to become sharper. But the others also, uh, we find a greater sense of reluctance to tell lies, to engage in backbiting, to engage in the other uh, deadly sins in this time. And some of the great uh, ulama of the early period of this ummah used to say that to break one of those commandments is also to break the fast. Sufyan al-Thawri, rahmatullahi alayhi, one of the great imams of, of the Tabi'een, used to say, and this was really part of his fiqh, al-ghiba tufsidu al-siyam, backbiting breaks your fast. In other words, if you're sitting around and looking at your clock and waiting for the sun to go down and you're gossiping about somebody, you've already broken your fast. That was his position. Now that's too shadid, too harsh. Religion is merciful and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, overlooks formally these things, but still there is an inward breach of courtesy with the Creator in this sacred time when things happen, come from our tongues in particular, uh, that are inappropriate to somebody who is in the quasi-angelic state of maintaining the fast. So what we find is that in this time of greater focus, of greater spiritual attentiveness, nowadays you might say mindfulness, we have this uh, uh, possibility of using the senses in a purer way. Uh, it's often the case that when distractions are removed, we become more in the space. We're more aware not only of time, but of place, and our focus on nature can be improved. And also, because nature is something that is not egotistic, it's the pure creation of God and contemplating it uplifts us and ennobles us. And this is a Quranic mandate and the believer always longs to get away from the smoky city with all of the drug dealers and the capitalistic uh, competition and into virgin nature. That's a sign of the, the sincerity of one's, one's belief. That when you are surrounded by nature and nature speaks to you with its lisan al-hal. These are the signs that are fil-afaq on the 
horizons, that the nourishment that that brings to the soul is increased, that we learn more through the contemplation of the mute witness of the beauty, the order and the symmetry of creation. And this is brought by our traditions of art and architecture into the, uh, the physical architectonic space. So Islamic art and architecture focus very much on looking beneath the surface of nature to the order that lies beneath, which bespeaks the divine orderer. So the arabesque, so tessellation, so vegetal motifs remind us of this inherent aristocratic human nobility, karamna bani adam. And this is one of the gifts of the fasting month of Ramadan for those who choose to open uh, their spiritual eyes during this time. It's, it's a time of tremendous spiritual recharging and reconfiguration according to, according to the fitra, the way that we're supposed to be. And then when this happens, we find uh, the divine presence and the unique aspect of fasting amongst all of the different forms of ta'at, obedience that we have, is that uh, there is a particular uh, aspect of fasting that connects us directly to the divine. And this seems paradoxical. Isn't that what the prayer does? Isn't that what the hajj does? Ibadah is a connection with the, the divine. But in the case of fasting, there is something that is inward because the fast is invisible. Nobody really knows if you're fasting or not. People know if you're praying or not, if you say your five prayers in the mosque. But fasting, who knows? There is a degree of inner discipline and wholesomeness and sincerity uh, that we find during the fasting month. It is between us and our Creator. So we find in an interesting Hadith Qudsi, and the Hadith Qudsis tend to speak about large global um, principles, and this is a Hadith narrated by Imam Bukhari, on the authority of Abu Huraira, radiallahu an, أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال قال الله عز وجل كل عمل ابن آدم له إلا الصيام فإنه لي وأنا أجزي به. Every action performed by every son of Adam is for him, except fasting, which is for me, and I will reward him. Again, it seems paradoxical because do we not expect reward for every positive thing that, that we engage in? Is this not part of the nature of the religious life? But certainly, this is how it happens. That where you have this sincere action, this directness, uh, that where you have the uh, direct connectedness between the human heart of the fasting ego, uh, uh, suppressed human being relating directly to the divine and recognizing our dependence on the divine, that you have the reward given as it were directly, that there is a direct connection between the fasting person, this is person. And this is because the shayateen are chained up, because the ego is subdued and therefore rather than just going through the motions, there is a reality of being present in sacred time surrounded by the symmetries of nature and reconnected in this fitri way with the Creator. Uh, another hadith that says the same kind of thing. Every action is requited tenfold up to seven hundredfold, except for fasting, because fasting is mine, I shall reward it. But has the hadith not already said you will be rewarded according to these uh, proportions? It is because in fasting there is the principle of sabr, holding the hand back from stupid pleasures, restraining the tongue, the gaze, the other aspects that get us into such distracted trouble throughout our lives that are the cause of the, all the sufferings of humanity and you're back in this fitri, self-contained space of sabr. Mm? And a saum, nisfu sabr, the hadith says in Tirmidhi that the fast is half of sabr. Mm. And sabr is the essence of spirituality. Not just going through the motions of religion and hoping for brownie points in heaven, but instead self-restraint, self-discipline, sincere brokenness, in kisar, in facing the divine. Mm. That is where real religion begins. Not self-important strutting up to the front row of the mosque and knocking off your rakahs and wondering who's looking. This is nothing to do with religion, really. This is just another ada, 
worldly activity. And we all have to work so hard to make it ibadah rather than ada. But in the case of fasting, when nobody's looking, you're taking a rest or you're reading Quran somewhere or you're at work and nobody's looking and nobody's knowing, there is an element there that is directly connected to the divine and where the demonic in us is genuinely subdued and where the demons leave our metabolism, the principles of light will come in. Inna shaytana yajri fibni adam majra dam fadayiqu majarihi bil The shaytan flows in the son of Adam along with the veins and arteries so limit those courses with hunger. If we're full and we have a sugar rush, the emotions come more easily. When we're broken with hunger, uh, there is the possibility of humility, which is the basis of the religious life, because to puff yourself up before the divine is the end of your religious life and your pretension to be a Muslim. Humility is the essence of everything. Hayat is the nature of the true believer. So this is modesty because pride is God's alone. Pride, kibr, the worst of the deadly sins because it cannot coexist with the fear of God. The others can, we can be hypocritical, but if you're really puffed up with pride and you think you're some big shot sitting behind the wheel of your new 500 series Mercedes and you're wondering what people are thinking about you and full of pride like Fir'aun and Haman, well, you have nothing to do with religion really because you're competing with the divine who alone is Al-Kabir. So inkisar, tawadu, humility, this kind of shrinking of our pompous selves that happens in Ramadan is precisely about the enlarging and the liberation of the spirit. And this is exactly what all of these beautiful hadith mean and that is what it is for the shayateen themselves who normally have such mastery over us to be chained up. But the hadith says, stand up. The reward is not some kind of automatic reflex. Stand up, make use of this time. Allah has given you these beautiful ibadahs and this context, this space in which to purify yourself and address him. He has made it as easy as possible for you, but you need to make the effort yourself to make it a reality rather than just an outward form. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this fasting month from us and make it a month in which we permanently step up, in which we become more truly Muslim inwardly as well as outwardly, in which we become delightful neighbors to others, in which we become truly Allah's khulafa, representatives of humility and self-blame rather than representatives of puffed up, outraged pride and self-vindication. Amin Rabbil Alameen. Barakallahu fikum wal afu minkum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.